John Faulkner here, and uh, welcome to a Survival Dispatch Live. Uh, these we are ain't done one of these in a hot minute. We haven't, so yeah. we're going to start doing these more. And uh, join with me today, Chris Weatherman, a.k.a. Angry American, as always. And uh, today, special treat, we got Matt Tate from American Survival Company yeah. uh, down here. We're going to be shooting a lot of videos in the next couple of days. Um, so we thought we'd come into the, the studio. Um, we put out a couple days ago that we were going to do a Q&A. So that's what this is. Uh, this live is going to be all about. And uh, we'll just go until we're done. So if you guys have any questions uh, that you would like to have answered while we're going here, uh, feel free to leave them below Post and them we'll we'll get to them at the yep. end. Post so, them up, yeah. Um, so yeah, so all right, 30 seconds. What you been up to lately? Just working on books, working on books, working on a TV show. Um, you know, we're, uh, we have about have our package together to start presenting the studios. Um, that'll be next month. I'll be in LA doing that. But working on book 11, I, you know, I'm trying to put as much effort into that. Of course, Western Resolve is still working on. And the survival manual. So there's a lot going on. Busy. Busy, busy, busy. Busy, Matt, busy, busy. What you been up to lately? Oh, running classes, lots of uh, survival classes. We've got a... Give them the website, shameless uh, plug. Okay, americansurvivalco.com. You can go to there and check out all the the uh, classes we've got coming up uh, in Jacksonville uh, and in the Ozarks. Uh, That's Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville, Florida. There's more than one, Matt. There is, there's Work probably on more than one. Uh, in uh, northwest Arkansas in the Ozarks, and we've got a really big event. That's what I've been spending most of my time on called Flintlock, uh, the Ozarks coming up. Uh, lots of really good instructors uh, coming to one place uh, to teach, and uh, it's the 17th, 18th, and 19th. So just and registration still open. It is. It is. So it's going to be a really good time. You guys can make it. I have to help this guy with everything. Yeah. And where can they go to sign up? You can go to americansurvivalco.com and get signed up. There you up. go. So yeah. go check on that. It's a cool event yeah. uh, with a lot of cool instructors, uh, very similar to pretty much what, what we've built here at Survival Dispatch. You yeah. get a large group of, of people that contribute information. Very knowledgeable uh, people there. Yeah, too. and and what it leads to is not just one person's perspective or yep. way to do it. Uh, yep. Multiple ways to tackle the same situation or issues or problem solving, you know. And it's cool to see different different approaches. So, uh, all right, so we're going to kick it off. So questions uh, that you guys have, feel free to leave them below. It can be on any topic as long as it's kind of relevant to prepping and survival. Um and we'll just go from there. So, all right, first question is from Sarah. Sarah wants to know, uh, what first aid supplies do you think are missed in most people's bobs? Hmm. I don't think enough, I don't think people carry, well, you and me mentioned this a minute ago, enough antiseptic style stuff. Yeah. My antiseptic of choice, that and I'm gonna say an irrigation syringe. And when I say irrigation syringe, I don't mean one with a needle on it, I mean a, a large bore syringe to do yeah. irrigation with. Um, Betadine, you know, the old military first aid kits used to have that little bottle of Betadine. Mm -hmm. That's perfect because you can take any water then, put that into it, give it a little while, it'll sterilize that water and you can use it for wound irrigation. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about infecting yourself with something else. So um, for me, I like a little bottle of Betadine and an irrigation syringe in my kits. Yeah, and, and the reason we started with, you know, uh, some antiseptic and, and that can be Neospor and it can be wipes, uh, it yeah. can be all kinds of stuff, is if we are talking about utilizing items that are in a bug out bag uh it's probably a, a bad situation yeah. uh, hospitals might not be up running and functional so a you know a small cut can lead to a big infection yep. that you know you can you can lose limbs and life based on oh. in, on infection yeah. so yeah. trying to clean that keep it clean so you don't get infected gangrene's nothing you want to deal with and you mentioned wipes I, i'm going to say this i'm not a fan of wipes yeah for, for, they're just for an for option bobs. for bags only because you know they sit for so long generally and they're always in, sitting in generally hot ass conditions in your car and something and those things can dry out yeah. and you think you have it yeah. And then you find out you don't. So. Neosporin for me. Neosporin, yeah. Uh, what I see a lot is in people's medical kits, they're either putting tampons or just regular gauze instead of S-rolled or Z-rolled compressed gauze. And if you have to do some wound packing, uh, you want those compressed gauze. Yep. Um, so uh, I see that the whole tampon thing just kills me that people it, still think that's a good method for plugging bullet yeah. holes or punctures. or. And, and the biggest thing with, with tampons... Uh, you, you, you can do your own experiments. Get them wet and see how much they expand and then see how much like a zero gauze expands. Expand, you yeah. know, and you, you know, start pulling a zero gauze out and I mean, it's like a magician, you know, pulling the handkerchiefs. Pulling the scarves out of his, oh, yeah. When, yeah. When we do our stop the bleed course, we'll have like uh, one liter clear bottles of water set up and we'll put those in there and then we'll pour them all out and see 
What comes and out? you just see, I mean, everything just flows out of the galls. And uh, yeah. so the proof's kind of in the pudding, you know. Yeah, the other thing I, th I think, too, when, when we're talking to these medical kits and bobs is I think everybody, nearly everybody, and too many people focus on gunshot wounds only. Like, that's, that's the only sure. thing that's going to happen to you. Um, you're far more likely to hurt yourself with one of these. Yeah, absolutely. Um, or an axe or, or a sprained ankle. You know, I think a Sam splint should be in everybody's bob. Mm -hmm. You know, they're lightweight. Um, and it's better than tying two damn sticks to your leg should you hurt yourself or your arm or whatnot. Yeah. Um, that's another thing that, that should be in your kit. Uh, but, but get away from the, the, the fantasies of all these gunshot wounds. I mean, if you're living a life where you're, A, having to use a gun every day and getting shot at and dealing with gunshot wounds on a, on a daily basis, you know. It's a rough life you've chose. It's a rough life you've chose. <laughs> yeah. You've made some poor decisions, and, and you don't need to be that prepped because you're not going to live long. I yeah. mean, you're just not. And somebody else is going to come along and get all that cool shit you've stacked up. You know, come back to reality, you know, of, of what you're really going to be facing. Burns, cuts and scrapes, potential fractures, sprains, that kind of stuff. Eye injuries is another one. Um, I don't think most people in their kits have a, an actual eye patch with the ocular um, antiseptic yep. that mm -hmm. you can put in there. That's a big one. I've had some pretty severe eye injuries in the past, and, and I know the value of having that on me so and, and I got one more that I'm gonna get to uh, with regards to another question but we'll we'll move on to question number two here uh, if it's if a person is on an extremely tight budget what's the best things that they can do in their preps well like I was talking we mentioned this earlier because we kind of went over these briefly but um, one of the cheapest ways to start prepping is what we call copy canning so it's when you go to the grocery store especially if you have a store that does BOGOs you know that's the perfect time yeah to do copy canning it, you know, when you're in there buying the stuff that you normally eat, you know, boxes of macaroni and cheese or soups or canned can whatever, shelf-stable Pasta. stuff, pastas, spaghetti sauce. Yeah. When you buy one, if you're going to have spaghetti for dinner tonight and you're buying that box of spaghetti and that jar of sauce, buy two of each. Yeah. Then set aside a, a place in your pantry to start your, your prep pantry and put those things on the shelf. And... Every time you go to the store, do that. You don't have to buy two of everything every time you go to the store. Right. Just pick up a couple of things, start building your pantry. Then the next time you're going to have spaghetti, buy two again, put those two on the shelf, take that other one that you had there before, yeah. use it. Now, yeah. now you're rotating your stock as well. Um, that's really the, the cheapest way to get started with doing that. And then for storing water, you know, if you drink sodas in two-liter bottles or if you know people that do, collect those rinse them out, yep. fill them with water, stick them in a closet, keep them out of sunlight. Um, they'll store forever, and it's a good way to put water away, and it didn't cost you a penny. Yeah. It cost you nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that was one of the things, like Chris said, you know, we did a whole video on BOGO uh, shopping yeah. pretty much, BOGO yeah. preps. Uh, you know, buy one, get one free. And uh, you can literally build a pantry in six months oh, to yeah. a year for free. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, it's things like cereal, it's everything. And it's everything. It'll be, I mean, I mean from Band-Aids and shampoo all the way to canned corn and, and Fruit Loops, you know. Yep. I mean, you can get it all. Um, and it's not costing you any extra money. Just yeah. set that stuff aside. Yeah, it's costing you zero. And you know, and because that pantry is going to be for more than, you know, we always we always look at this stuff as when the, when the SHTF, you know, that's what I'm doing this for. Well, you know, you're probably going to end up needing it for your personal SHTF. Yep. Someone gets laid off from work or somebody gets hurt and can't work, times get tight. Now you can dip into that pantry, and that's when it's really going to help you. Yeah. You know, yeah, we're we're prepping for for harder times, but you know, you're far more likely to suffer suffer a personal end of the world yep. mm -hmm. than you know we are the overall one. Yeah. Which the odds of that are still pretty good, but tips uh, and tricks. It's just pretty overwhelming when you start thinking about getting Everything. all this stuff. Everything. You know, and. Yeah. It's, it's overwhelming thinking about the process of getting all the stuff. It's really overwhelming when you think about what it does to the, the pocketbook. So just one thing at a time. Uh, if you try and focus on the whole picture, it's just going to be uh, kind of intimidating, and it's going to kind of flatten your tires. So and just one thing at a time. Start putting things up. And we have, you know, on the Insider, we have checklists for you guys to help you do that that will yeah. establish kind of where you are now in each category and then how to build on those categories because you know we most people are are 
green on ammo. You know, 90% of the guys out there Good got all go. the ammo they're ever going to need, go. but they're black on medical supplies, yellow on food, you know, and red on water or whatever. You know, they need to start refocusing their efforts. And we, and we have resources on the website for you guys to download that will help you determine that and how to get started, too. Yeah, and, and I think I think one of the biggest things, you know, with regards to, you know, if, if you find yourself on an extremely tight budget is stay within that budget because I think so many people as soon as the as soon as your preps exceed your budget, you then stop. Yeah. Right. You're like, dude, it's just it's taking too much of my money. I couldn't do it anymore. And you stop instead of you know, in, instead of the turtle and you well, keep going. Too there's another there's another resource out there. Every every city generally has a place where you can go buy the dented can stuff. Yeah. Right. Now yeah Dented cans are less safe, and some of the stuff maybe passes expiration dates, but expiration dates on canned food is yeah. a joke. So that's another cheap way where you can go in there and buy super cheap stuff. And two, one of the things we did when I moved to North Carolina, we didn't have a big food storage there at the time because we just moved, so I went to save a lot. Right. Canned stuff there is cheap, and I was buying flats of canned stuff, and you know, for like 500 bucks, which, you know, that's a pretty good investment. For 500 bucks, I got a lot of food that was yeah, right. just for storage. And if you're not necessarily alone, like I'm, I'm kind of part of a group, and five or ten bucks a month uh, gets put into the pot, and somebody goes and needs it, rice or beans or whatever. Hit spices. the restaurant supply or Costco yeah. or Sam's. Whatever. And, yeah. and that yep. way it's not just all on you. So if you don't have that network, maybe that's part of the solution is to start developing that. You should be anyways, yeah. but... Yeah. Uh, develop that so it's not all on you. And so, yeah. You, yep. Yeah, absolutely. You yeah. need a group. You need a community. Yeah. yeah. I hope that helps. Uh, all right. Next question is from Lisa. She says, I'm a survival dispatch insider and love it, by the way. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if y'all could give some information on SHTF while you're at work or trying to gather up the kids from school and trying to get home. Uh, get home bags for kids, EDC items for women with kids. Uh, any info you guys could provide for a mom would be great. Mm, have a plan. Plan. First yeah. things first is you, you need to have a plan, and everybody needs to know the plan. Now, yep. if, you're, if your kids are younger, obviously they're not going to be able to know the plan necessarily per se. But one thing people need to consider in, in this is you're going to have a problem when it comes to the kids. Um, if there's a true emergency situation, what are the schools going to do? Yeah. Right. They're going to lock down. Mm -hmm. Think about that. That's going to be their immediate protocol. Lockdown, nobody's in or out. You know? You're going to have a hell of a time there initially trying to get your kids out of school. Um, my advice would be to make friends with the principal, have that discussion ahead of time. Look, if something happens, I already have a plan. Like my kids, you know, a little bit's the only one left in school, and she's 14 years old now, and she knows that she's not to be locked down in school ever. Like, if they say they're locking down to school for a shooting or whatever, I just told her, I don't care if you have to throw a chair through a window, get out of the building and run like hell. Mm -hmm. And she knows where to go to, and I'll be there, you know. Um, Eventually, I'll be there. Right. But, but yeah, you need to have that plan ahead of time. Um, you know, and then planning for, for bags for kids can be tough depending on their age, yep. Yep. their abilities. You know? And depending on the emergency, yeah. if you wear high heels to work uh, and the emergency is vehicles don't work, whatever the case might be, or there's congestion, you need to have footwear in your yep. trunk or something. And work. for your kids. Yep. You know, and if you've got those point. little ones, you better have some quality shoes that you can put them in because the Crocs they wore to preschool today yep. may not cut it to get them home, yep. you know. And I, and I would say part of the plan also has to be uh, if your kids take, you know, public transportation, school buses, things like that, you have to know what route yeah. that yep. bus takes uh, constantly because they might not be at the school itself Correct. when something happens. Uh, and I'll tell you, uh, just yesterday, it's funny how things work, just yesterday, uh, one of our employees here got a call from his wife that their daughter's school bus uh, T-boned a car in an intersection, Ooh. and he had to go pick her up from the accident site. site. Yep. Like, they couldn't even get another bus there to take them back to school or take them home. Uh, and it's one of those things where if that same scenario happened without communication, you have no clue where they are, yeah. you know, along the route. And you're going to go to the school. Yeah. And With every try, other parent, too. Right. Think about and that. And then trying to get information on, on what school, what bus number. I don't know what bus yeah. number. What, yeah. you know, it, and it's going to be really hard. So, I mean, that's, that's one thing is, is you got to know, uh, you know, if your kids take a route like that, where are they going to go? If they walk home, 
what is the route that they walk home? Yeah. Because that's the route that you're going to need to walk. Don't take another route and yeah. you guys, you know, do circles and yeah. don't see each other. Right. Now they're at home wondering where you are and you're at school wondering where they are. Yeah. Um, so you got to know that path, you know, from their school to home. Um, you know, as far as I say, as far as get home bags for kids, uh, Make sure they have a water bottle of some sort. I was gonna in their say bag. every day your kid leaves to go to school, they should have a water bottle. Even if it's even if it was an empty Zephyr Hills water bottle. Yeah. Crushed up, put at the bottom of their bag, so that they know they could go to a water fountain real quick and fill it up. Yep. Uh, you know, we're not talking like they don't need a 32 ounce canteen that they can boil <laughs> over a fire. Just something small that they can keep. Number one. Kids don't drink enough water during the day. I know I'm setting a bad example by not having water on here, but they don't drink enough water during the day, so they should be carrying a bottle of water. Number two, you know, th throw a cliff bar in their bag. Yeah. It doesn't have to be an MRE. Let's not go crazy. No. Throw a cliff bar, <laughs> throw yeah, something granola like bar, that bar, anything like you that. You know, in their bag, and you tell them like, it, like if you're just horrifically hungry. I tell Eat my I thing. tell my three year old that all the time. Oh he's a damn hungry. Every time he's That's horrifically so hungry, hungry though. Yeah. 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 So it's like if they're beyond hungry, yeah, eat the dang thing. But the next day put another Replace one in there. Them. You know? Um, but make sure that they have something like that. So, you know, if, if they were locked into a school or something like that for hours at a time, they would have something. Um, you know, that that would be some of my advice. I know it's hard as far as get home bags for kids, you know, there's just not a lot that kids can bring into school. Well, nowadays. I would throw in a, a whistle. Yeah. And then a, a not the 99 cent emergency poncho, but a but a relatively inexpensive plastic yeah. poncho would be another item because it'll have multi uses for them, and they yeah. could be finding themselves trying to walk home in the rain too. Yep. And that's light, and don't you know don't take up no space. Yeah. Yep. My kid has uh, one of the uh, level three A yeah. uh, body Plates. armor panels. Yeah. It's super lightweight. It's really flexible. I'll stop up to a 44 mag, and she knows it's not a conversation she has with kids at school. It's just know. in her bag. It's just in her bag, and it's rigid, so it helps her bag stand up. Yep. But um, she knows what to do if there's trouble at school, whether it goes on the front or the back. Yep. Those are conversations we have, and that's kind of an interesting conversation having with a 7-year-old. But there are ways to do it uh, without turning them into the weird kid, uh, you know, for having that type of yeah. stuff. But, I mean, that's the world we live in now, right? Well, so. you know, we've just had two school shootings here this week, you yeah. know, and, and everybody's solution is to get rid of the guns. We can't bend reality to meet our will. Right. We have to kind of, our will has our will has to yield to reality. Yep. Mm -hmm. And like you just said, that's the world we live in, so we have to deal with these issues, wow. you know. Yeah, and, and it's it's a different time. Uh you know, we span kind of in our in our 30s and 40s here, yeah. uh, and it's a different time. I mean, it, it's one thing where, you know, I've been out of high school for, for 20 years, so it's not like I, you know, grew up in the 60s. It's yeah. like I used to take a shotgun yeah. to middle school, yeah. put it in my principal's office, yeah. and after I was done, take it out and go quail hunting after school. I used uh, to have one. I used to have a gun in my car. Yeah, right? and, and but it's a different time now, yeah. and, you know, and so how do we – you know, how do we, you know, send our kids to school? Like Matt said, you know, to inform them uh, on what can happen. And, and we kind of have different age kids here. You yeah. know, we got seven, three, and 14. So, yeah. you know, it spans kind of the gamut too. Um, you know, and, and I think it's hard to expect your kid to carry a backpack with books and stuff in it and then like, hey, and, and a carry a get home bag. Yeah. You know, yeah. now you can make a smaller bag. Um, I think fanny packs. I, I know they're, they're kids, yep. you know, put a fanny pack together if they're old enough to have a locker. Leave it in their locker, yeah. Leave it in your locker. Yep. It sits at the bottom, it stays there. Um, but in all actual, in, in, in most, you know, common, I think, situations that'll happen, um, as far as a mom, a dad, a parent, just parent in general, um, your system needs to include a bag for your kids. Yeah, you need to be, to it's either in, in your kit yeah. Which it should be, in my opinion, you should get a, a compartmentalized, a small zippered bag or something that's in there. That's that's for your kids. And again, the shoe thing, you know, young girls like to wear flip flops to school. Some schools don't let them, but you know they like to wear shorts and flip flops to school. They want to be comfortable and they want to be trendy and look like everybody else. But you know, and then little ones too, in particular, you know, you better have footwear available for that walk home. Like if. We had to walk from my daughter's middle school to our house. It's probably 10 miles or so on rural country roads. Yeah. It's not a hard walk, but it's a long walk, you know. 
you know, and, and you know, you want to have the proper shoes on. I wouldn't want to do it in flip flops. Right. Yeah. You know. No way. So, make, make sure you've got the right footwear. So, any other last statements on this one? That's it. That's it for me. No, I'm up. good. Yeah, right. I think we've. So, and like I said, guys, if you have any other questions uh, with regards to anything we've said or another topic, uh, just leave them below and we'll hit them at the end. Yeah. So, all right, next question here. Uh, what's the biggest mistake you guys made when you started prepping? This one's from Dylan. Not starting soon enough, in my opinion. Mine was probably buying cheap junk instead of waiting uh, and saving a little bit longer and buying good quality that's, stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna go with you on that one. You know, I'm a... Is that your final answer? When you first, yeah. Okay. It is. I'm okay. not even going to phone a friend. Okay. Um, when you first get into this, like, like Matt was saying earlier, it's pretty daunting. Yeah, you know, is. when you look at everything that you need to be doing and, and all the things that you want to have to feel prepared, um, it it's expensive. I mean, it's, it's, it it's a huge investment. And so sometimes we want to cut corners, you know, and, well, I can get the $20 bag instead of buying the $80 bag. Well, and you're going to find out that $20 bag is going to fall apart on you. Yeah, all that stuff you're putting in there that you're thinking your life is going to be That you're going to stake your life on. It's going to be laying on the ground because your $20 bag. Yeah, apart. so I, I am now firmly in the buy once, cry once camp. Right. I will wait, save the money, and, and make the more expensive purchase. Just Because, so, again, like Matt just said, you're staking your life on this stuff. Yeah. And we've said this, me and John have said this many times. You're staking your life on it. You know, do you really want the cheapest thing that you can get to fill that need, or do you want the best thing you can get to fill it's that need? It's just like, uh, you know, the eight dollars seven ninety nine tourniquets on uh, yeah. on some of these places where you can get them with the plastic versus, windless. Yeah, versus you know <laughs> the real one that's anywhere from twenty five to sixty dollars, mm -hmm. depending on which one you get. I just always ask people like, how much is your kid's life worth? Like, is it is it really worth just paying eight dollars for, or someone you love, or whatever the case yeah. might be? Uh, I just if I can't afford it now, I just save until I can afford it. Yep. But well, you wind up with a false sense of security uh, in relying and, on and, stuff that's and junk. that's a big one, a false sense of security. Security, yeah. you know. Oh, I've, I've got this stuff. I've got it all. I'm good to yep. go. You know. And two, when you guys buy your tourniquets, take them out of the damn wrapper and stage them. Yep. Oh, that's that's one more thing that kind of goes hand in hand with that was. <laughs> I would have I had all this stuff in my bag without any idea how to use it or I had a concept in my mind but I had never tried any of this stuff out like a water filter and so I had this false sense of security if something would have would have well, happened I watched YouTube videos I knew how right? to do it it's all just a theory until you do it yeah. and uh, if you don't test it out you don't know it's, it's you like know, you Mike don't want to learning said, to use it when it counts it's like Mike Tyson said everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth right <laughs> I, I, I would say I would say one of the business, business mistakes uh, that I made was, uh, you know, Chris and I, we did a video a couple weeks ago, actually. Um, and when you start talking about a, an SHTF scenario, um, there's multiple areas, rings that you have to go through. Oh, absolutely. You start with personal, then mm -hmm. you then you move out to to regional, local, uh, then local regional. and then regional yep. and then national yep. and then global. Uh, and I think I think a lot of times too many people they spend money on something that might be uh, you know a national security or you know a a worldwide issue instead of dealing with what is most likely to happen to you. So yeah. you know us living in in Florida, it's like hey you better spend more money on prepping for a hurricane or bad weather to come through. Absolutely. Matt, you would storm tornado. Yep. You know, Matt in Arkansas and stuff. I mean, it's tornadoes and stuff. But you know, if if I'm you know saving up all my money to buy radiation suits, yeah. and I have you know four radiation suits in my closet that cost me X amount of dollars, yet I have no extra propane. To, right. to run my grill when the power goes out or my gas to run my generator when the power goes out during a hurricane like we go through every summer here, yep. the priority is wrong. And you're sitting there like, man, I wish I didn't spend so much money on all that crap that's sitting in the closet that I'm not using right yeah. now while I'm in a unfun situation. Yeah. You know, so so I would say make sure you start, uh, you know, with your personal disaster. And that's 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 losing a job, like Chris said, exactly. or somebody getting injured in your house. Make sure that that those situations are taken uh, care of before we start worrying about what's North Korea 
yeah. you know, doing and, uh-huh. and how should we be preparing for that? Um, you know, so I would say, you know, make sure you start with the most likelihood preps, uh, really start to build on those and then start to build outside of those. Yeah, so you get the foundation laid. Yeah. You, know, you, you need to be able to survive a couple of weeks in your home minimum with no outside inputs. Mm-hmm. You should have everything from fuel to food to water to everything so that if you had to hold up for a couple of weeks, you can do that. You know, and then once you have that established, then start start moving out, you yeah. know, broaden that out. Your, your and, and I would say the, the other thing that I would say is if you don't think you're ready, don't try to get ready on the next panic buy. Yeah. If you don't think you have enough magazines for your AR or pistol right now, do not buy them when after there's a mass shooting and there's complete hysteria. Yeah, You've kind of made your bed, stay in it. After about two or three months, it calms back down. Yep. Prices come back down. The hundred dollar P mag that you saw on Gun Broker is now back to nine ninety five or ten dollars, <laughs> and then purchase them in preparation for the next event that's going to happen. Because I, I see so many people. It's like once again, we all deal with it. When bad storm season comes, freaking there ain't a generator to be found. Oh no, there's no, no plywood it, to be found. But it, what happens is. In Florida, it's so funny because you can walk into Home Depots and Lowe's and you see this. They will, there's a storm predicted, tracks are looking good, it's going to hit. They will send tractor trailer loads of generators down. And they will sit in those stores until a day before. Then they're sold out and there's fist fights and there's all this anarchy going on. And then the storm maybe veers a little bit and misses us or comes over and it's not so bad. Things aren't that big a deal. And the next day, All everybody's good. lined up at Home Depot. On like Lowe's. another hurricane is never going to come here. Generators still in the box. They were never even prepped to run the return of the damn things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a, a 5KW generator is about 500 bucks. Yeah. Not a huge investment, but a massive asset. Yeah. Because yeah. when there is no power, a little power goes a hell of a long way. And you'd be yeah. surprised what you can run on a 5KW generator. It's like I try to tell people all the time, dark is dark when it's dark. But yeah, yeah. It's really yeah. dark. It's, dark is, you know, what's the definition of dark? It's, Absence of light. There yep. you go. So. <laughs> uh, so so that'd be another one, too, you know, is don't don't panic. And you see it so much. You see it in panic buying at the grocery stores, panic buying at, you know, hardware, home improvement it's stores, like, panic like buying water. at gun shops, water. Bottled water disappears from grocery stores so fast when these things happen. But yet everybody takes that bottled water home to a house that has multiple sources of running water in it yeah. mm-hmm. that's relatively free. You're paying pennies on the gallon oh, for it. Oh, yeah. And Absolutely. you could just as easily store that water yeah. instead of running out and buying all those plastic bottles, which are horrible for our environment really anyway. Store the water at home. Go buy you some food-grade five-gallon plastic buckets yeah. and fill those damn things up and set them in the garage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's, it, you know... Yeah. There's <laughs> all right. So we hope that we helps. Go on all day Don't about make those that mistakes. Stuff. Yeah, there are mistakes to be made. Uh, oh, this will be a fun one. All right, this one comes from Adam. Uh, what is the most overlooked item people put into a 72-hour get-home bag? So what they overlooked item they, they should have. What is the most overlooked item not put into a 72-hour? You know what I'm going to say. Go for it. That foot care kit, man. Yeah. I'm all about dealing with blisters and feet because if it's a 72-hour get-home bag, that means you're planning on walking. Mm-hmm. And again, 99% of the people walking around today are not wearing adequate footwear for any kind of a long-term walk. They're wearing stylish stuff that looks cool or whatnot, or or dress shoes for work. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a utilitarian guy. Um, for me, form follows function. Function comes first. I don't care what they look like necessarily, as long as they're quality to yeah. get the job done. Yeah, and that goes for everything. So taking care of your feet's a big deal. If you can't walk, you're overlooked done. item. I mean, that's that's it. If you're talking about getting home, it's probably your own two feet that are carrying you. You did, was it 52 miles? 52 miles in 17 T- hours. For that was, uh, you telling me about that really kind of got me to thinking pretty heavily about that and the fact that the whole point is to get home, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not to uh, go, you know, start an army somewhere or, you know, live off the, it's to go home. Yep. So if your feet are carrying you, but what was your time? That that was really interesting to me. Like yeah, we did it. We did it in just over seventeen hours. Uh, it was a fifty mile event. Um, that's that, moving, man. 
man. That, that's, that is yeah. Um, and, and we had a couple obstacles we couldn't get through when they were, so it ended up being 52 and a half miles that we did in 17 hours. Um, and, and yeah, it was one of those things where um, 35 pounds uh, of weight in your back, uh, plus water, uh, any consumables. And, uh, and it was one of those things where your feet were all you had. Oh yeah. You know, so, so yeah, I mean, I would say overlooked items that, that people have, um, socks, Spare blister, socks. blister kits, um, you know, and I, I would say, I would say, I know some are going to argue, let's just let the trolls come. I can, I can feed them off. Um, I think an overlooked item that most people don't not put into your bags is enough calories. Yeah. Get rid of some of the snares, get rid of some of the fishing stuff and just put more food in your bag. Because we live under this idea of like, I can go three weeks without food. Listen, you can't go three weeks without food if you're just sitting at your desk all day. You are not going three days with hiking, you know, 15, 20 yep. miles a yeah. day. You you will get hangry and yeah. you will kill somebody. Yeah. Um, well, I, and plus you you just you just get run down. You, get you, ran, you lose and, energy so fast. And here's what I'll tell you. Uh, you know, during that event, when when you mentally when you get mentally fatigued you stop wanting to do things oh, yeah. you stop wanting to drink water as much you stop wanting to eat as much you you just don't care you you know you have bad blisters or bad feet yeah. or and you just don't even care anymore you just start to get slow but a lot of that has to come from just not getting the calorie intake into you that the your body needs energy your yep. body needs it to continue thinking um you know and a lot of people you know they want to throw um like day trex bars in a you know Whoa. cliff bars things like that um but they also just don't i just don't think you carry you know it's think about how much food you eat in three days at the activity level that you're at right now yeah it's usually just for most people it's going to work for eight hours sitting at a desk and then coming home uh Take that and now start thinking about, hey, you might have to, uh, you know, hike 20 miles a day. You might have to gather water. You might have to gather food, firewood. You, firewood. Yeah. Yeah. you might have to build a shelter depending on, you know, what your system you is. You may have to run for your damn life for a little ways. Right. You know. And here's the thing with the 72-hour bag. A lot of people treat that thing like it's there from now on I'll survive forever. The inch bag. Like I'm never so coming So how far home. can you actually move in 72 hours yeah. being realistic with yourself? Um, and like how, how long would it have been before you could have done another 52 miles? Like uh, how tore up were your feet to where you would uh, just had been like I got a little. Well, I mean, we did that survival class like three days after. Mm -hmm. I was a little sore, you know. I, I mean, my, my legs felt pretty good after that. Uh, I did have a, a good sized blister on one of my foot still. Um, I think I did pretty good, but you know, it's one of those things where it would have probably been, uh, I would say, like a week before I was like, hey, let's let, let's go right. do this again, you know. Uh, and that's fifty miles. Um, yeah. If you're a hundred miles from home. You know, so on, think on a road about trip. Yeah. what that purpose is. And if you're traveling a long distance away from home, 72 hours in a vehicle is not 72 hours on foot. Oh, shit. Oh, That's heck, the point no. that I... No, no 72 so. hours in a vehicle, accordingly. from right here, we can be in California. Yeah. 72 hours on foot, which no one's going to do 50 miles a day no. for three solid days. You're, you're going to do somewhere in the 10 to 20 mile range, yeah. depending on your fitness and what, yeah. everything else and terrain and whatnot. So you're looking at... 30 to 60 miles, yeah. literally, for three days. And I know some people are going to be like, oh, I can do well, whatever. That's great um, if you we're can. talking about the average person here, right. not people who, who go out and hike on the weekends and that kind of thing, just your average person. You know, most, you know, me and Alan were talking because the book we're working on. We as humans have become more sedentary. Mm -hmm. And also, we don't sweat as much as we used to or should to get rid of toxins and stuff from your body. And when you go from this sedentary life and you're suddenly thrust outside, especially if, let's just say it's here in Florida in the summertime, and you're going to have to cover 60 miles in the next three days, you are going to be one miserable person because your body's going to be going through a whole lot of change that it's not used to. Yeah. You're going to be sweating stuff out. I mean, there's going to be a lot of toxins moving around in your body. You're going to need to hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Water's going to be your biggest issue. Yep. And then calories, like John said, keep those calories coming. And a 72-hour bag is no place for snares yeah. and, and, and traps and all this other stuff. Maybe a, a small emergency fishing kit, yeah. about the only thing I would carry. Because you're not going to be sitting anywhere long enough to set a damn trap. 
One more thing that comes to mind, because it's always, always in my bag, uh, is either some people like Body Glide or yeah. Monkey Butt or yeah. Gold Bond. Yeah. But something to deal with chafing. If we're yeah. talking about going a long ways, especially here in Florida, like when I step off the plane, I, I just start chafing, right? Yeah. Crouch, uh, crouch every, Rod is a yeah, real thing. Every time I thing. come down here. Um, so that's a huge thing for me is to have some I, I keep of, a small bottle of Gold Bond medicated yep. in my bag. Not only for chafing your crotch, you know, some guys get it in the rear, yeah. but your feet too. Yeah. Put that Find on the feet, feet to help yeah. keep them dry and stuff. So, you know, again, foot care and monkey butt, crotch rot, whatever you want to call it. it. it it's, it's, a, it's real. <laughs> I, I, I will tell you, uh, you know, TMI, TMI, uh, you know, my, my derriere was hurting more than I'll anything bet, else. Yeah. You know, See, I started, that's what I'm saying. I you get the chafing some, in the rear end. See? Yeah. It, it can, and it's one of those things where, um, that was the most comfortable, uncomfortable thing. At yeah. The end of the height. Yeah. I, t I took all the skin off of one of my pinky toes that, you know, that hurt, but, but that was because this that is was starting to get, yeah, I heard, a, I heard an interesting, uh, a solution to that for a guy that was out hunting. He was way up in the Rockies hunting, was trying to come down and he was so chafed. He couldn't walk. Yeah. He took the, he had a sandwich with him and he pulled the piece of bologna out of the sandwich, folded it in half, Put it stuck it between his cheeks and was able to walk out. Because think about all the grease that's in oh, that, yeah. you know, and yeah. really that's what you, friction is there is the right. issue. So, right. sounds Guys, gross. that was worth fifty dollars. <laughs> that, that right tip, there, right there. That's packed a piece of bologna. bologna. Yeah, not I'm just saying, bologna not there. fried bologna. <laughs> no, not fried bologna. bologna. <laughs> but that's thinking outside the box. You right. know, I mean, you think about how yeah. that's really kind of brilliant, actually, to me. The guy's like looking at, it, he's like bologna. Hmm. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. I know where that's going. <laughs> I wonder if his bologna had a person. <laughs> Wow. All right, we're moving on. <laughs> moving on. Uh, all right, next question is from Eddie. He wants to know uh, if we sell Survival Dispatch hats. Um, they will be on the website soon. We have them in quite a few colors. We have them in black, gray, tan. Uh, they'll be on the website soon, so keep looking for that. Um, all right, moving on. Ben asks, uh, what is the most common but most worthless, useless item people put in their bug out, in their bug out bags or preps that you see? So it's pretty much the opposite of the last question. So that's bug out bag. I'm gonna say for bug out bag, this one useless and up. worthless item people put in their bug out bag. Deck of cards. Yeah. But to me, that's utterly useless. Um, yeah. You know, you're not gonna be having time to sit around and play solitaire if you're on a bug out. Um, you should be alert to what you're doing, and you're gonna have a whole lot of tasks to be fulfilling. So that's one for me. Um, that and and really big lights, like lanterns. Like I've seen some people that carry like. Yeah. Oh yeah, you know, like a big lantern light, for, you know, for can. I mean, it's another one. It's heavy shit. Heavy shit. It's a it's a really tough question because uh, depending on your geographical location, yeah. weather patterns, what may seem really silly to me in the Ozarks might be critical to have down here. So, I think the safe answer is probably something ridiculously heavy, like a lantern instead yeah. of a headlamp, which. Is going to trump all over lot other lights in my mind. Yep, um, every bag should have one of those in it. Absolutely. Yeah, they, uh, you know, the the deck of cards is what what I was thinking when we when we went to this. Because you see it, every kid. At, as as a through hiker, you either hike until you can't hike anymore, and then you're done and you go to sleep. Right. You eat and you go to sleep. Uh, and I think you're going to want to do the same, you know, with regards to. To a, a bug out situation or a get home situation, um, y you know, and, and it's it's one of those things that I I think that the the useless item I think starts to come in the redundancy items that people carry. That's what I was just going to uh, say. Yep. You know, the third layer of of this or that. Well, or having the big metal pot plus a nice metal cup. Yeah. You don't need them both. The, the, the redundancy you know. I think can can start to become come pretty useless. Um, and can definitely add a lot of weight um, to to a bag. You want to comment on that? In terms of redundancy, yeah. I get. I mean, I get two as one. You're, you're almost yeah. You're almost breaking that that cardinal rule of two is one and one is none. But at some point, and I, you you've you know have con had conversations before. You've talked yeah. about this. You have to draw a line somewhere. Yeah. And so, carrying something like a steel pot. How many of you guys have ever broken a steel pot? I, I haven't. No. And I've had them in fires. I mean, and it's also the absolute hardest item to fabricate 
in nature. Yeah, you're not going to. You're not going to make a steel pipe. Now, so. you, oh, yeah, you can make a clay vessel or you can make a basket and fill it with pitch, whatever. Yeah, I don't hear all that crap. You're not going to – it'll never be a steel pot. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah, I, I'm going to throw one more out there. Uh, I uh, This is for, like, get home bags and stuff. I know trolls are going to come again. They're going to come again. Uh, gold and silver in a get home bag. Gold and silver. Yeah. It's just it, – for the most part, it's too short of a journey for gold yeah. and silver to be worth anything. Just put extra cash. Man, it's too damn heavy. Just put cash. Yeah. Just put extra cash. Well, that that goes bag. back to the, the overlooked items. I meant to mention that. Cash. Cash. Yeah. Put cash in your in your bag. That's yeah. one thing most people don't do. Uh, you, you know, and it's one of those things where it's a get home situation. We're having to, you know, we have. Let's just say we have no water on us, but there's a gas station. They have no power. Ninety nine percent. I don't think they're going to take a tenth of an ounce of gold. No. But they'll take a ten dollar bill yep. for water. You know, yep. same with if you come up to somebody. If Matt has water and I have gold, Matt doesn't want gold at that point. He wants his water. Yep. But he might be able to use cash for but, something else from somebody. But then he might else. also take that gold. I take a I take a one ounce round for a sixteen ounce <laughs> right. bottle of water. You know, right. But I think the, the <laughs> but also the amount the amount of which you have to put into oh, that, it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You're gonna it's give crazy. me thirteen hundred dollars for a bottle of water. You know, it's crazy. And yeah. even a tenth of an ounce of uh, of hundred and thirty bucks. Hundred and thirty bucks yeah. right now. Yeah. And it's hard to, to really break that down to like a little you know here's a five dollar flake. Yeah. Right. Nobody carries five dollar flakes no. of gold. So. Yeah. Um, you know, I think gold in, in like a get home short term scenario. Now, if you're talking in your long term preps, mm -hmm. oh, absolutely have gold. Yeah, yeah you, absolutely. That's yeah. what a safe is for. Well, and two, uh, for me, PMs, I don't look at them for bartering. Right. They're, to me, they're not for bartering because, again, st establishing that, that level of value is going to yeah. be very difficult. For me, PMs are a storage of wealth because if tomorrow morning we wake up and, you know, they, they announced that the dollar is dead, you know, all hail the new dollar. I can go get a hell of a lot more new dollars with gold and silver than I can old dollars. Because, yeah, you know, right. if they're going to say, all right, the new exchange is 100, 100 to 1, 100 old dollars for one new dollar, you know, well, yeah, what's the gold exchange? Oh, it's $500 an ounce right now. There we go. Now yeah. we're talking, you know. So I look at it as a storage of wealth, personally. Yeah. All right, so there's some there's some worthless, useless items that people put in their bug out bags. Uh, all right, Dustin's got a, uh, I'm going to say a statement. Uh, please tell people to stop putting snake bite kits in their bob. Absolutely, snake bite kits don't work. Even the sawyer extractor, it does not work. Don't do it. Don't use it. Um, I've been to uses. wilderness medicine courses with expedition doctors, and one of the things that they were had advertised was come and learn about dealing with snake bites in the wilderness. And I got there, and that was the one thing of that whole week I was excited about. And what did they say? Remain go, calm and try to walk Go out. to the emergency room. Go to the emergency room, room yeah. <laughs> That's what they said. Go to the emergency yeah. room and get an I could have loved yeah. that course. So, yeah, yeah, I mean. You do more tissue damage with those suction kits. Yes. Yeah. The, the, um, the best treatment the, for, for immediate action, after action treatment for snake bite, which is the hardest thing to pull off. Remain calm. Yeah. Yep. Like you said. And get yourself to the next level of care. Now, if it's a post event and there is no next level of care, well, the Indians have a word with that, and it sounds a lot like ducked. Um, <laughs> but that's just the way it is. There, there are uh, some things that have been written about uh, old medicine with plants that have been used. I don't know. I haven't tried those, so I can't advocate well, I, those. But like, I would try it. Things like plantain. And, you know, that's a that's a drawing, a drawing agent. It, it'll right. draw. Maybe it'll draw some venom out. Maybe it won't. But once you're hit, the venom's in there. Uh, yeah. You know, it's and it's. Don't put tourniquets on. Don't cut and suck. Don't no. use this. Not just, here in the U.S. Anyways, no. now a friend of mine from Australia, they've got a different whole different type of snakes. There, well, they've you know. got snakes that will kill you. you right. Yeah. So you turn they it, they aren't fast, there, so you don't here die. Here in yeah. the U.S., no, don't yeah. turn. You don't want to localize that. All right. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, all right, next one's from Chuck. Uh, what impact will religion and Christianity have during an emergency scenario for preppers and non-preppers, Christians and non-Christians? Uh, yes, I think this is a pretty loaded question, uh, and, and it, it's an interesting aspect. Um, I think one thing with regards to living in America, it is one of the only countries. It, I've traveled the world quite a bit. Um, there is not religious fighting like there is in most of the world. You're right, right. Not We're, open fighting. Not open yeah. fighting. Um, you know, there there are still countries where you hate other people for their religion, they hate you for your religion. 
Uh, plain and simple. Yeah, we've spent 17 years, the last right. 17 years in a place like that. And so, hell, they're in the same religion, just different sects of the same religion. Mm -hmm. I, I honestly think that when it comes to, to religion uh, in, in general, um, you're more likely for it to start a scenario than it is to, to be a huge situation once a scenario has already yeah. began. You know, and I, I think, too, with not just Christianity, but, but any, any religious morals and values, I think people will, will come up against those in a hard way, uh, and they'll be forced to make some really hard decisions based yeah. on their values. Because um, everybody, you know, uses the scenario, well, what are you going to do if, you know, a hungry child shows up at your house? Are you going to turn them away or are you going to feed them? Or the, I will never steal, I will never, I would never yeah. do that, you know. Um, you know, never say never, you know, you don't know what you're going to do, you know. Sure, as humans, we want to try to help if we can help. We, we want to try, but do I help them at the detriment of me and my, mine, you right. know? Um, and that's the thing that kind of, when that I heard that question, I kind of thought in, in two different directions of, uh, you know, the whole turn the other cheek and do unto your neighbor, those types of things, in that uh, there will probably be a lot uh, of help given, but there will probably be a lot of people that are taken advantage of because of that giving nature. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, it's like anything else in life. Once you've been burnt, it's only for a certain amount of time, and then things change. But, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's really what comes to my thinking in terms of something happening after. I mean, I think it'll be, you know, faith for, any, for, for, for people is a good thing, no matter what your faith is in, and especially in a time of crisis. Having... You know, the faith and, and the hope of, of, of something bigger than you kind of looking out for you and that, you know. And that's something that, better happening. That can be, you know, strong. You know, if, if you're in a real crisis situation, having that to fall back on that, you know, this is bigger than I am. I'm just a small part of it, but, you know, I'm live, I've lived my life right. I've done the right things. That can help motivate you on, um, you know. But at but, some point, where's, where's does the, the switch flip? Well, as I say, and, but and, then the opposite can be true, too. For the atheists out there who can be like, you know, this isn't a personal thing. God's not out to get me. This is just happening, and, and they can deal with it, too. Because right. like you just said, you know, the Jews in, in the 40s and the 30s is a prime example, you know. Did they think God had forsaken them at the time, you know? Right. Well, you, you know how, and, and look what their... You know the way they reacted to what was happening to them. They were very passive, and they let, right. the, you know, they didn't resist. Um, so it can be a double-edged sword, in my opinion. Uh, right. Very well, can be a double-edged sword. All right. Next question: uh, What is the best way to store ammo when you're on the go? Oh, I got that right here. In a magazine. Hell yeah! All day. Uh, so on your person, uh, in a magazine. Or yeah. in a in a go bag, you know. Um, so. You know, but loaded mags. Yeah, yeah loaded mags. Um, I will say, you know, I do see it quite often uh, in in the the gun industry that I work in on a on a daily daily basis. Um, you know, and then in the survival market, you know, we have a lot of people that that have bug out bags or get home bags, and they keep like AR ammo, like five five six ammo. You know, in the, in the boxes in their ammo, and and it's one of those things where you got to be careful about that because. If you got two mags, let's say two spare mags in your bag, and then four boxes of ammo at the at the bottom of your bag, yeah, right. if you get into a situation where you're changing mags out, you're gonna number one, you're gonna run out of mags that are loaded, yeah. and the worst thing you can ever do is have to reload mags in the middle of a situation where you need a firearm. Uh, number two, if if you're having to move quite a bit and you're dropping mags. You can run out of mags. Now you have 40 rounds or 60 rounds or 100 rounds of ammo yeah. at the bottom of your box or at the bottom of your bag. Yeah. And you might not have a magazine to put that yeah, ammo into. Yeah. That's something I don't think enough people work on when we, when we start talking about magazine retention. You know, because in the military, what do those guys do? Mm. You generally, they used to drop mags. Right. Like in Vietnam, they just drop mags. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they go Sometimes round coat. They, they press it and forget it. Yeah, they. But but you see nowadays they're moving. To everybody's wearing dump pouches. Magazine right. retention is a big deal. We don't have a logistics train behind us. If we're out there in the field, yeah. post event, it, and the, the, there's the, and there's no quartermaster with with cases of mags for us. You know, back at the ranch, right. you got to keep those things. And I can't remember right now. I think it was it Black Hawk Down where they actually were able to drop them a resupply. They opened up all the mags, and they were all on stripper clips, but they hardly had any magazines. 
so they had ammo in stripper clips, but they had been dumping their mags mm -hmm. while they were moving through the city, uh, dumping their mags, and they got to the point where they only had one or so each. Yeah. And they had all this ammo, you know, yeah. airdropped, boom, right to them, and they were all on stripper clips. I mean, I'm a, I am a fan of stripper clips and bandoliers. Sure. I do right. like that as yeah. a far for, for reloading on the run. If I wanted to carry extra ammo in my ruck, it would be a bandolier of stripper clips with several guides, stripper guides, oh, because yeah. you lose that thing, you're down to taking them off one at a time, pushing them in anyway. So, But I do like that because you can take that bandolier and throw it to somebody even. Yeah, you know, yeah. and if you're them. carrying a bunch of ammo in your bag, then you've already came to the conclusion that there's a possibility in some sort of event where you might have use to it. use <laughs> more than one. So it doesn't seem like that much of a further step to just take those 40 rounds in those boxes and stick them in a couple yeah, of extra if, mags. If you as cheap have, as mags are now. If you have emptied every magazine on your load carrying equipment, you know, the odds of that are unlikely to start yeah. with. But you've, you've been got in big a, problems. You've been in a hell of a long gunfight, you know. <laughs> and one more problem that you don't want is loose is loading rounds magazine. in your bag. I, I, watched uh. a, I watched a video, I watch a lot of videos of conflict around the world. I'm, particularly interested in civil conflicts, and so like Syria. And I watched a video, it was a GoPro angle, of a guy, uh, ISIS fighter, laying on the ground, loading AK mags, because he had two magazines that he went into an assault with. One of his guys is, is I'm going to say bounding back, but they weren't bounding. He was just running back and catches around, falls right in front of him, and he just kind of wiggles over to use this guy for cover. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> As he's... Dump. I mean, he's got cardboard boxes and, you know, the little paper and the AK yeah. rounds. Yeah. He's picking that and, and stuffing rounds and mags in a damn gunfight. <laughs> um, like Matt said, not where you want to be. So, not all right, be. moving on. Uh, but, yeah, let's just, before we move on, let's just say rounds go in a magazine. Yes. Uh, if you want to make them, you know, if you're worried about weather and things like that, you can't put them in a Ziploc bag. And that's well, about you, as far as you would ever go. If you buy quality ammo that yeah, is annealed, primer sealed, sealed, primer yeah. sealed, you don't even need to yep. worry about Ziploc bags. So, so don't buy – for. I think you should have both kinds of ammo. I think you should have the good ammo and the cheap stuff to kind of practice with. But your go-to-war mags better have yeah. sealed primers yeah. and annealed yeah. brass. And, All right, next question. Have any, have any of you dehydrated meat rather than freeze-dry it? Uh, how did it turn out? If so, did you dehydrate it raw or cooked? Uh, what would you give the shelf life of it if it was stored in mylar bags with moisture or oxygen absorbers? Uh, I've done it. I make biltong, which is just dried meat. Um, air drying meat is the oldest method of preservation known to man. That's how we did it originally. And it will last as, it'll last in perpetuity, I think. It'll last forever. It might get mold on it, but you can scrape that off. You can still eat it. Um, biltong that I make, I take and it's not even like making jerky where you cut it so thin. Biltong is about three-quarter inch squared strips, basically, that are hung up and air-dried. Just in my kitchen, I hang them up, air-dry them, done. It's a beautiful fragrance when you walk in. Oh. It actually is. It's, it's not too good. bad. It's not too yeah. I've done... So I'm uh, saying, I see. We had, uh, you know, just the old metal clothes hangers, and we would just hang strips off of that in the kitchen, and yeah. Uh, a couple days, it's good to go. And I, I, I've sped up the process a little bit. Uh, you can take like a regular box fan that you buy at Walmart yeah. or something, yeah. and you can actually lay the meat on that and put a regular like air conditioner filter over the top of it. Yeah. Put bungees around it and let the air blow through it. Because uh, because there's a big difference between uh, letting the I'm going to say the the environmental temperature dry it out rather right. than like a dehydrator well, which is actually going to be hot right it's going to apply some heat yeah right. you know moving air is a big deal if you can get air moving over it's great and like the biltong i make it i don't dry it all the way out it has a chewy elastic kind of quality to it it's not bone dry mm -hmm. you can bone dry it yeah but i prefer it to have a little bit of that chew to it it's, it's really and when you cut it it's it's like shiny looking on the inside right. it's almost like a cutting a jelly bean is what it looks mm -hmm. like you know um, you cut jelly beans? Everybody's <laughs> bit a jelly bean and looked at it. I just put it all in my mouth. That's uh, what it, I don't know right. why you would. I'm going to leave that alone. I was about uh, to. Mm, uh, he left himself open. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, you air dry meat. Yeah, and, and you know, it'll last. The only thing you got to be careful, though, is in anaerobic environments, lack of oxygen is mold can, some molds can grow. Yeah. So you're almost better to store it in a paper bag, believe it or not, in a cabinet. 
So. So there you go. I hope hope that helps. Um, dehydrating meat is is. I Oldest think it's method. delicious. Yeah, yeah it's great. Um, all right. What are some of your favorite knots to use around the campsite? We're tying ropes. Ooh. What are some of your favorite knots? Uh, We're just going to name them out and kind of what we use them oh, for. Oh, I, like I like Clovis hit, uh, hitch, uh, hitch and then I like square knots. I'm a big fan of the square knot. I love it. And what do you use them for mostly? A little everything. Just yeah. whatever, you know, whatever I need to do. And it depends, too, on what you're doing. You know, one of my favorite knots is the Prusik. When you're doing yeah, something, you cool need to huh? move one. Yeah. And then I, the one I showed you. Yeah, the thrown bowling. Thrown bowling. Yeah. You know, it's a quick way to put a loop in a line if you need to um, without having to actually tie it. It's something you can do super quick. Um, but, yeah, it's, you know, knots is a good skill to practice, and it's great with kids. Yeah, yeah I used to I used to know a lot of knots because uh, I had to learn them for demo, and then I forgot them when I didn't do that anymore. Um but the problem was they weren't practical to everyday life. Yep. That's why they got forgotten to yeah. me. And so I would just kind of be the guy for a long time, like, uh, if you don't know a knot, just tie a lot. But <laughs> Don't know a knot, tie a lot. <laughs> right. uh, but when you start No matter learning, what, it always ends up as a double <laughs> order hand. It's a knot this big. Uh, when you start learning some knots that have practical daily use, like a Siberian hitch is probably one of my favorites. Yeah. Timber uh, hitch is a great one. I yep. like it. Trucker uh, hitch is a nice Modified one trucker hitch yeah. with a slip. That's you showed me that. That's what I was just about to say. Yeah, I love that. He showed me that in the last thing we did. <laughs> but you can secure loads. You can use them to hang uh, and carp you get leverage and, that way with that. Yeah, thing. yeah absolutely. I mean, so absolutely. it's it's nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think knots are something that uh, I think it's a skill that's overlooked. Yeah. Quite a bit. Absolutely. Um, I think it's also a skill that's, you know, like Matt said, there's three or four knots. That, that you can get by and do almost everything yeah. everything with. You don't yeah. need to you don't need to know all hundred and one not yeah, no. make it because because at the end of the day, twenty five of them are all going to do the same thing. So as yeah. long as you know one of those twenty five, you you'll yeah. be able to. And there's some really good apps for smartphones for knots like Grog Knots, oh, yeah. Knots 3D. Yep. It's like two or three bucks, and they show you you know in three dimensions the. The not being tied yep. and how to do it, and you can go back and play it and play it. So, tons of really good uh, resources out there for that. All right, we got our first hypothetical here. Okay. okay. Hypothetical: Would you rather? And this is from Casey. Hypothetical: Would you rather live in Southwest Oklahoma or Eastern Tennessee? Eastern Tennessee has more water and timber, but so, uh, Southwestern Oklahoma is less densely populated. I so, know since, a reason. The, since this man lives near. Uh, Oklahoma, we'll start there. I grew up in northeastern Oklahoma, and there's a reason there aren't that many people in southwestern Oklahoma. <laughs> uh, I would say there's Tennessee, probably more rattlesnakes in southwestern they, Oklahoma yeah, than there are people. Yeah, there definitely are. <laughs> and which is the uh, reason there's not so many people. <laughs> yeah, I would say go east, go to southeastern Oklahoma. A um, lot of a lot of resources there, but given between the two, I say Tennessee. Uh, yeah, I take the Appalachians too. Uh, you know, or the Ozarks. I would say move into your neck of the, the woods. The Ozarks is the bee's knees. Because you, you have that, the benefit of that, the, the terrain style of like the Appalachians. Mm -hmm. Some of those old growth forests, yep. hardwood forests, lots of water. Tons of water. Lots of water, which Oklahoma is seriously lacking in. Um, and it's not as crowded. You know? Everybody's yeah. wanting to move to Tennessee. Everybody's wanting to move to Tennessee. And, uh, and I've started looking at the Ozarks. There's Beautiful, a right? number of very nice assets that, that that area has. To include American Survival Code. That's right, they're That's located right there. there. <laughs> Shameless plug. Shameless. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, we, we can always we can always find grass is greener on the other side, sure. but there's also some places that grass doesn't grow. And uh, yeah. y you don't want to find yourself there, you know? And I think, I think that kind of leads to uh, the hypotheticals that I think a lot of people talk to, like we're just bugging out into the middle of the desert. But first of all, I don't know what you're going to do once you get out there. Second of all, if it's the middle of the desert, uh, everybody can see you from 25 miles away also, just like you can see them. Um, you know, there's not that much coverage. You know, uh, you, 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 we, we talk about, when we talk about land and environments where people live, we talk about carrying capacity. Yeah. So what's the carrying capacity of the land? Can it provide you with food, water, shelter, fuel? Those are the things you're going to have to get off the land, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and going around and kicking old sagebrush stumps up out of the ground so you can have firewood right. all day long this is a hell of a lot more work than knocking over an old poplar tree and bucking yeah. it up. And it's know? not to say that you can't, uh, with 
skills and training like survive forever in those environments. Right. People have done it yep. forever, but it's going to be a much harder existence yes. yep. in a place that has significantly less resources. And you'll, and you'll be so, much more subjected to the, ver- the the vagaries and swings of environmental um, conditions. Like if there's if it don't rain for three or four weeks, is your water hole going to dry uh-huh. up? You know, um, that kind of thing. So. Yeah. I'd rather be in a place with abundant resources as opposed to scarce resources. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that answers that. Moving on. Um, All right. Chris wants to know, not this Chris, another Chris. Uh, Chris wants to know holster options uh, for a bigger guy. He wants to carry a 43. So, um, you know, holster, uh, you know, being a bigger guy says, you know, it's harder to to carry appendix. Um, You know, appendix carry is... Uh, I'll say it's not for everybody. It's what I choose. Um, bigger guys come in different shapes and sizes. I mean, I'm 6'5", yeah. 225. Uh, I carry appendix every single day. Um, a full-size, uh, you know, M&P or a full-size Glock with a Surefire um, uh, X300 Ultra flashlight on it and a Trigicon RMR on it. It's a big gun. Um but I carry it because I've, I've come accustomed yep. to carrying it. And, and Chris can attest, uh, you know, I mean, we can get in the truck and drive 12, 12 hours. Uh, I carry it the entire way, yep. take it off when we get to the hotel room that night. Um, it's with me every single day. But, you know, I, a lot of people, they just like, I, yeah, it doesn't work for me. A lot of guys, you know, I uh, got a little bit of a gut. I got a little bit of a gut. If you got a lot of bit of a gut, um, <laughs> you know, it can be it can be difficult at times. Um, it can also be one of those things where I think um, guys don't have the correct holster situation mm-hmm. and the correct belt situation yep. uh, in order to wear it. And what I see a lot of guys doing is they try to carry their gun too low in their pants. They're mm-hmm. trying to get it under, we'll call it the, the, the bulge. Yeah. Uh, they're trying to get it under the bulge and, and it becomes really uncomfortable. Uh, like the middle of my grip sits at my belly button actually yeah. you know so my gun sits up a lot higher um number one that allows it to not be so far down in my pants that i can sit down yeah you can sit down i can sit down it's not pelvis, jabbing me into my pelvic region yeah. you know it sits up a lot higher i think also a lot of people um don't work with it enough like i can just make a slight adjustment as i'm sitting down right. kind of push it out a little bit let my gut kind of go behind it just a little bit it doesn't print as bad and it's comfortable. You know, we've been sitting here the whole time. I'm carrying my gun, uh, and and it's it's comfortable for me. Yeah. Uh, these two guys don't carry appendix. No. Uh, and and like I said, it's uh, Matt. Go ahead, tell them. Uh, as far as appendix, tactically speaking, it's there's probably no better place to carry yeah. it because uh, it's really fast from the draw. It's easier to defend and fight to to get to it, uh, and it's easy to get to with both hands. Right. Um, but it's just never going to, I mean, it'll, it's never going to be comfortable for me. I've tried it, and it's just not my Yeah, thing. I'm the same way. Um, but he hit on something that's really important, too, is the attire that you're wearing, a good gun belt. But also what's really important, if you're wearing something inside the waistband, is either with regular denim, something that's two sizes too big so it doesn't kill you all yeah. day long, or flex denim. Is, I love flex denim, man. Get a little and bit of stretch up in there. will stretch and allow you to carry comfortably yeah. without having to buy Stuff that's, that's too, and, too and big. positioning it like I carry on my right hip, but I carry it about the four o'clock. Yep, me too. not on the three o'clock, not a right on my hip. Right, you know, small of the back. I've known some guys that do that. That to me, I worked with it. It's just, that's just it's like a damn right. combination a of trying idea. to get a yeah. gun out of. Yeah. Um, so I like the four o'clock position because again, when you mentioned you know weapon retention, mm-hmm. blading my body away right. keeps it's on that far side. I can I can keep somebody at bay for a minute if I have to. But the biggest thing to do is to practice with it. So yeah, yeah. I practice, I have a range at home, so I set silhouettes up, I stand directly in front of them, I mean, in meat space, and I'll push off a target, blade my body. I'll even act like it's in a headlock or it has me in a headlock, doing the same thing, and then firing from here. Yeah, it's, it's something you do slowly and build up to, yeah. to do quickly, because you can't hurt yourself. But that's how these things are going to happen. They're they're going to happen this close. And I'm going to. I have to say this because you brought that up. 
go get some training. I don't care if you're we're in the military yep. or combat. Yeah. Go get some training. Um, if you're a first-time gun owner, don't be intimidated. Like, these people are there to teach you things. Yes. But if you're going to practice with this when you go home, and you should, and you should do that a lot, Dry you should too. be practicing the right things. Yes. And that's the best part of going and taking one of these classes is they're giving you tools to go home and say, you're, you're not going to be John Wick when you leave here. No. But this is what you need to practice on so that you can get that speed up. None of it's ninja stuff. It's all the basics. Yeah. People who look like ninjas just do it really fast. So. And, yep. and and Matt does make custom Kydex holsters. Uh, so you make know, some great ones. I've got he, some of them. He uh, so he you know has has quite a bit of experience working on these as well. Uh, you know, so I got a I got a 43 here. Uh, this is a you know shameless plug for another buddy of mine. This is a Veil Solutions holster. Uh, they make fantastic holsters. This is the Apex. Um, and you know, and one of the things that's kind of new is a lot of companies are starting to use these wings. And what this does is it as your belt goes through, it kind of takes the holster and it kind of tilts it back so that the grip of the gun unloaded by the way so that when your belt goes on instead of the grip kind of poking out and sticking out and, and you know printing a little bit on your shirt when your belt hits this it kind of sucks it into your stomach a little bit more so you don't get as much printing um, you know which helps quite a bit and there's also some companies now like like Bale suit that puts this wedge I, just, I was looking at the that ramp there that's, yeah and yeah. what this does is when it's in your pants it actually kicks the front of the gun out just a little bit so it brings this grip once again which the grip is always what prints the most if you're right. worrying about like hey is somebody going to notice if I'm carrying a gun it's the grip it doesn't matter if this thing was another foot long yeah nobody's right. really going to see inside your pants uh, so, you know, being able to tuck this thing, you know, in this way, cant wise, and then angle it back a little bit with the wedge on the back, which a lot of companies are, are starting to implement, um, is a really good, good feature. Um, and then, you know, as far as comfort goes, this has a full sweat guard, what's called a full sweat guard. So it covers the entire slide of the magazine. Um, I actually, um, I don't prefer a full sweat guard. Really? Uh, I yeah. like it cut real that, low. I was say, because I can see that digging. Yeah, right I like them. There's times where it'll dig into you a little bit, uh, so I like mine cut low. Now, there's there's pros and cons to it. Uh, you know, then you get some sights sometimes that'll dig into your gut. Uh, you know, so the, the biggest thing with concealed carry that I see is, number one, um, it's expensive for most people because... It nine nine point nine nine times out of ten, you're not gonna find the holster that works for you best. I can tell you exactly what holster I use; it doesn't work for you. Chris can tell you what holster he uses; it doesn't work for you. Matt can tell you what holster he uses; it doesn't work for you. So you could buy three holsters because we said they were the best, and it still doesn't fit yep. you right. perfectly. Um, so usually it takes a little bit of trial and error. I always say um, try to find buddies that mm -hmm. have holsters yes. that you can borrow and then wear them for like a week. Yeah. Cause that's another thing is people are like, Oh yeah, that feels good. Well, you've been wearing it for like 30 seconds, yeah. bro. Yeah. You, you haven't been over to pick paper up off the floor you haven't or, gotten in your car. Or, or tried to drive your car, yeah. you know, uh, or anything. It's, you know, and if you're going to carry concealed, like you, you said, determining what the right holster is and what the best carry position yeah. for you is, it's all part of it. Cause you might say, well, I'm going to carry appendix. And you might find out you could be, you know, a real thin little skinny guy, but you just say this is just too damn uncomfortable for me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I carry either a Glock 19, sometimes a full size 1911 or a Springfield XD on my four o'clock. And I don't print that that hard. Yeah. No. Well, it and a lot of those how holsters you dress. will be canted forward. Exactly. And that makes a big difference yeah. on printing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it, and again, that's what you got to find that out. But when you decide to start carrying a gun too, you're going to change your wardrobe. Yep, you got to dress to the gun. You've got to dress to the gun. To. Or you're going to have to match the gun to your dress. So mm -hmm. some days if I'm going to just run to the store real quick and I'm in shorts and, and flip-flops, I'm going to pick up my Colt Mustang 380 yep. and drop it in my pocket. Right. You yep. know, at least I've got something. Right. So. And, and it's one of those things, too. I'll give you just a little tip. Uh, if you wear shirts that have patterns on it, like this, it, it takes tends, away from the printing. It tends yeah. to break up printing a lot more than like a solid black it shirt does, like yeah. this, because I mean, you get wrinkles and folds kind of in in a shirt, and then when it's broken up, it doesn't stick out nearly as bad. Just a little tip there, um, you know. So, but yeah, it's uh, a good quality belt, uh, a good quality holster, and, and then work on what position yeah. works best for you. So, and then. Practice, Doing practice, it. Practice, practice, practice drawing that weapon yep. in the mirror. You know, every night before you, you're going to get undressed, clear your weapon, 
and then just practice your draw and your presentation. Draw and presentation. Um, and then practice it sitting down. Yep. Practice it from every position where you think you may have to draw your weapon. Yep. Practice it laying on your back, on the ground. You could get knocked down in a fight. You know, practice. And I don't think enough people do that. I think people, I've got my gun, I'm good. You know, and um, you know, carrying a pistol is a lot like ham radio, you know. You start learning once you start to do it. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I was, t I was talking to someone the other day. Whenever I got to a point to where I could put around where I wanted to put it, when I wanted to put it there, then I was actually ready to start learning. Like, I thought I knew something, yeah. like my whole life, you yeah. know. Uh, and then once I could do that, then these guys with a whole lot more experience than me started teaching me. Yep. This is where we go with that. But get training, get training, and practice. All right, any other questions we got? Uh, one from Chad. Uh, cash and an encrypted hard drive or thumb drive with important documents and pictures? Hmm. Cash? Cash and an encrypted hard drive or a thumb drive with important documents and pictures? All right, so, like, should he have it or should he carry it? Uh, I would, I, for me, I would go cash and thumb drive, which can be encrypted as well because it's so much smaller, you know. Mm -hmm. And there's no moving parts. You know, you can get a solid state hard drive, but they're expensive as hell. Yeah, they are. Um, but an encrypted thumb drive and cache, that's a small footprint. You know, that's how I'd do it. Thoughts yeah. on that? Same. Yeah, I, you know, I, you know, thumb drives are a fantastic way to store tons and tons of, of information on. Um, I think there's still some things that every single person should make like three copies of, you know, with regards to social security card, birth certificates, marriage licenses, passports, passports things like that, and keep it. Um, it's like one thing I do, like in my EDC bag, I keep a copy of uh, my driver's license and a copy of my CCW permit just in case, hey, you know, my wallet got stolen or something mm -hmm. like that. I still have identification on me. Um, pictures of, of loved ones. You should also have, I think, on, on thumb drives, number one, uh, memories are lost when they're lost unless you have, you know, some kind of backup of it. Well, uh, and, and But also a physical copy of it, yeah. you know. If, if I'm separated uh, from my three-year-old in, like, an SHTF situation, yeah. and, and let's just say a police officer finds him, yeah. they're probably not going to turn him over to me when I say, that's my son. Yeah. No. Here's if I have a picture of yeah. him and I that I can yeah. show him, yeah. or if my son is missing on the beach and I have a picture and I can start going up to people and like, have you seen this mm -hmm. kid or an amusement park yep. or something like that? Uh, I think it's very um, important to have, but yeah, a thumb drive, I, I think, in your bag well, and in your safe. Also, long-term SHTF motivation. Yes. Right? We've all heard those rules of three, yeah. and so recently I've heard them updated to three to 30 seconds to survive without the willingness to yep inflict violence on someone who means to do you harm. Yep. And then, you know, the, th the air, yep. uh, water, food, and then three months without hope. Yeah. To have a picture, yeah. I mean, that well, could be a really powerful thing to someone. Well, and two, like I said, I, you know, I follow, a lot, of, yeah, I follow a lot of civil conflicts around the world. And you see when this stuff kicks off, people get displaced. Sure. And a lot of time it's families fleeing in the middle of the night into the darkness and they get separated. But then they end up in you know, internally displaced persons camps or refugee camps. Same thing. Having that photo yeah. that you can, have you seen these people, you know, have you mm -hmm. seen the, any of these people, you know, um, and them doing the same for you. Right. Because, you know, most people don't have that right on them. Yeah. And so when you when you get to those folks, it, it sticks in their head. Right. You know, and so it's, it's, a, it's a big benefit to actually have that. So. Any other thing else? Uh, one last one from Wesley. Buy cheap gear while you're waiting and saving up money for the good gear, or save that money and wait and purchase good gear. Well, Buy once, the, cry once, man. The danger in that is, I'm just, I'll put, I, I mean, this will do for now. I'm gonna put it off. So, if a guy can be disciplined enough to say, I don't have a knife, so I'm gonna buy a ten dollar Mora that I know can get me by for now, but then I'll go and spend it. Well, on, see, that's different. You know, that's different. Yeah, different thing. But. You, he's not buying. You know. Uh, the, the three dollar knife from the the, the right. bucket at, at the right. convenience store. You know he's going to buy a more, which is a quality tool. Yeah, There's nothing is. wrong with that. Um, just don't buy the the Rothko stuff, yeah. the the the, the Coolgans, You know the all that kind of stuff. You know we all got budgets. Ones. We do. I mean, yeah, it's some a fact are of life. Yeah, bigger than others, but we've all got to think about how we spend that money. Yeah. and I would say. 
you know, one or the other, save up. Yeah. Save up and, you know, and we're find a, find a quality alternative in a, at a lower price point. And two, don't forget eBay places like that. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, I've bought great packs and stuff off of eBay, mm -hmm. really cheap. Yeah. Um, for people needing to get rid of gear. Yep. Trade's always an option now. The grid's not down, but I mean, how many times have I been either on Craigslist or Facebook yeah. Marketplace? Uh, I might have some I don't use anymore, but now I need this good knife or a water, whatever the case might yeah. be. I mean, there's there's other options. Yep. All right, one more question. Primary and secondary fire starters. Primary? A damn primary. lighter. I yep. want a lighter first off, foremost, above all else, and then I want a, my good ferro. Ferro rod. There you go. Same. Same. Absolutely. All right. I'll, I'll adhere to peer pressure. Same. Well, it's, it's hard to beat that. I mean, yeah, it's, it's better than a lighter it, it is hard or ferro rod. Yep. You know. Um, That's, you know, I, I think too many people overlook the bic lighter and they everybody go goes else goes with. directly to the ferro rod. You know, which it's foolproof. It's going to work. Yeah. But but it's a two-handed thing, and and there's nothing like fire. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. there's fire right there. I got fire. So there's no question of, am I going to get a flame? Yep. <laughs> now, do I have the skills to turn that now into, into a fire, fire yeah. is a whole other question. Because when, you know, I love it when people want to come to primitive fire classes. You know, I like to hand them a match and say, we'll start with this. If you can get a fire going with this, then we'll talk about primitive fire methods. Because mm -hmm. if you can't start a fire with a damn match, you ain't going to start one with yep. a bow drill. <laughs> yeah. So, well, guys, I hope you like this Q&A. Um, feel free to leave more comments below. We'll definitely be around. We'll, we'll. Uh, answer them as we can and uh, you know when you get a chance check out survival dispatch insider we'll make sure to leave a link below that 14 day free trial uh, every single month we do a 60 to 80 page uh, PDF style uh, magazine with on one topic it's fantastic we have 17 different writers including these two guys and myself um, that you know write awesome articles on one topic it's a, an amazing resource library that you're building um, and it's highly produced guys this looks as good as recoil magazine or anything else you're gonna pick up I mean it's it's really nice and then you know when you have a little bit of time and you need to look at, at amazing other websites go check out angryamerican.tv uh, to see what Chris is up to check yep. out his merchandise there check out what's going on with his new books and go check out American Survival Company for training. Guys, they do fantastic stuff, um, multiple trainers, and make sure you check out their Flint and Steel event coming up. Yep, Flintlock. Flintlock, Flintlock sorry. Flintlock, the Ozarks, yep. Coming up. It is coming up May 17th, 18th, and 19th. It's going to so be one great. week. One week, so make it happen. Uh, we appreciate you guys. We hope you have a fantastic day, and we'll see you next time.